So let's recap real uh, briefly what we've been talking about the past few weeks. Uh, we, we've said that one commonly held belief about religion today is that all religions are essentially the same, fundamentally the same, and only superficially different, right? Uh, many people believe that when you break down all the fundamental beliefs of every world religion, you basically come to the, uh, to the, to the same common ground. They all have the same thing in common, they just kind of express it differently. And that's true of many world religions, but when it comes to Christianity, we've said that the, actually the exact opposite is true. We said that when we look at Christianity, we find it is fundamentally different and only superficially the same. How so? The reason it's fundamentally different than any other world religion is because every other religion has prophets or priests who are responsible for helping us find God, right? They say, I am man, come to help you find God. But when it comes to Christianity which we see very clearly in, in the Gospel of John. What Christianity says is that Jesus Jesus says, I am God, come to find you. And that is fundamentally different than any other world religion. When we encounter Jesus in the Bible, Jesus says, not I am man, come to help you find God. Jesus says, I am God, come after you. And that is not the same as any other religion. That is fundamentally different. That changes every. That changes the way we think about everything. So John tells us from the very start that Jesus is not just a prophet. He's not just a spiritual guide. He's not just a wise teacher. He is not one God among many good God options. What John tells us is that Jesus is the only God option. Jesus said, uh, John said in, in uh, John 1 verse 3, Through Jesus all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And so John calls Jesus this Logos, which if you were a Greek person, the Logos was their word for the sort of unknowable, mysterious force of the universe that you couldn't know. And what John says is, no, there is a Logos, but he actually he came to know you and you can know him. And that is fundamentally different than anything else. And so today we come to an encounter with Jesus in which Jesus gets angry. Okay. Uh, and so there are two common views of God today. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing, but in general, there are two common views of God today. We'll call them the Eastern view of God and the Western view of God. And clearly, since we're in the West, we tend to think of God more on the Western view. So let me explain what that is. The Eastern view of God basically says that God is unapproachable. God is a consuming fire. Uh, it says God is all about holiness and only those who keep their lives in perfect order can hope for God's favor in their lives. So, so Islam is like this. Even Buddhism and Hinduism are like this, as seen in the belief in reincarnation. So why do, why do they believe in reincarnation? Because anyone who's honest with themselves knows that we need more than one lifetime to finally get it right. <laughs> I mean, would you agree? I mean, if God is unapproachable light, if he's like perfect, I need more than one lifetime to finally reach enlightenment, to finally reach a place where I am like him, so to speak. So that's generalizing Buddhism and Hinduism, but basically the Eastern view is that, that God is, is unapproachable, he is incredibly holy. Now, um, the Western view of God is, is kind of the direct opposite. It, uh, the Western view of God says that God, you know, God's your buddy. God is warm and fuzzy and there when you need him or her. God is unconditional love who only gets angry at the worst people, like you know murderers and thieves and anybody else you don't like. Uh, God is, uh, in the Western view, what you want him to be for you. God is your servant, sure to help you when you fall, okay? So the Western view is that God exists to please you. The Eastern view is that God is holy and can never be pleased. <laughs> so we're kind of stuck. Which is it? The Christian or biblical view of God is actually a mixture of the two. The Bible says very clearly that God is holy. God is unapproachable light. But there are times in the Bible when people drop dead because they uh, approach God willy-nilly. And that offends us Westerners, doesn't it? Because, you know, we don't want a God like that. We want a God made in our own image who does not require too much of us and does not expect us to change, right? That's, that's the God we want to follow. 
We want a God who is an enabler. <laughs> God, let me do what I'm doing and just pat me on the back as I do it. But the Bible says that God is so much higher and holier and wiser than any of us will ever be. The Bible says, in fact, that if you, get too, if you got too close to God, he would burn your face off. I mean, he's holy, incredibly holy. But the Bible also says that through Jesus, through Jesus, God is our friend. It says God demands you to be holy, but since you can't be holy, God came to make you holy. And so Jesus says, I call you now my friends. Okay? The Bible says you could not approach God on your own, so God humbled himself in Jesus and approached you. Okay. Our story from last week, the story of the uh, wedding at Cana, is sort of the... It kind of, kind of gives us more of the Western view of God. God, you know, Jesus comes in, swoops down, and saves the day. He, he, you know, he bails us out at the last minute when we run out of wine. But in our story today, we come face to face with the holiness of God in this scene. So, four things we're going to learn about the holiness of God. Find my clicker here. Four things we'll learn about the holiness of God. Number one, we're going to see the wisdom of the holiness of God. Number two, we're going to see the demands of the holiness of God. Number three, we're going to see the unholiness of mankind. And then lastly, we're going to see the solution to the holiness of God. So let's look at those at four things in this story. The wisdom of the holiness of God. So look at verses... 13 through 15. This is all in John, John chapter 2. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. All right, so the first thing we need to consider about this passage is the Holy Day context. Right, so it was Passover. And what this means is that there would have been a bunch of people in Jerusalem on this day. Passover would have been like Bike Week in Laconia, where like the population doubles, if not triples, with a lot of other things that Bike Week has, Passover would, not, did, <laughs> would not have. Um, but... Passover would have uh, been a bunch of people there in the city. It's, it's a big festival. It's a week-long thing. In fact, after this scene, Jesus is still you know, stick, sticking around for the Passover festival. Also, on Passover, people would have come to Jerusalem from all over. People literally would have come from different countries in order to be uh, at Passover in Jerusalem that year. And so because they came from different countries, they would have needed a currency exchange place in order to buy and sell anything in Jerusalem. So, for example, people could only pay the annual uh, temple tax in the Tyrian coinage, which was the coinage of the day. And so money changers provided an essential service to those coming from all over the world to the city for Passover. Also, consider this. Depending on how far they traveled it would not have been feasible for some to bring their animals for sacrifice with them. It would have been too far. They may have gotten uh, hurt along the way. And so people selling cattle, sheep, and doves would also have offered a much-needed service for anybody coming to the Passover feast. So the money changers and animal sellers in this scene were doing a necessary thing. So why then did Jesus get angry? Well, Jesus got angry because of its location. Think about it. We know for our own day and time that some things are appropriate in some places and inappropriate in others, right? So, for example, bathing suits are appropriate on the beach, but wear a bathing suit to a job interview and you're going to get fired before you get hired. <laughs> okay? Yelling and screaming are appropriate things at a soccer game. But you start yelling and screaming on a plane, and you're going to be arrested. Right? 
buying and selling and exchanging money all had a place, and Jesus was not saying that buying and selling were evil things. But he was making a, the bold statement that buying and selling was not an appropriate activity in the temple. Now, as I began to wrestle through this passage, I, I first thought that, uh, that, that buying and selling animals in the temple was inappropriate for the same reason that uh, you know, having my two goats hang out with us in my living room would be inappropriate. You know, it's just, you know, you have to file it with animals and smells and all this stuff. But we've got to remember that the Passover, uh, uh, the Passover feast included each family bringing with them their animal into the temple courts. So it wasn't as if animals weren't allowed there. It's the buying and selling of animals, the exchanging of money that took place. So it's not the animals themselves. Animals had to be there for the Passover feast. Um, and so... If you look at verse 16, Jesus said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. So in, in the parallel accounts of Matthew and Mark, uh, they would say that Jesus said, Is it not written my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. That's, that's a little more explicit. A, den, a, mar, you know, a marketplace doesn't sound as, as bad as a den of robbers. So why, why den of robbers? Well, think about it. So a robber is someone who takes something that is not his, right? And so a couple of things that Jesus could be saying here. First of all, if people did not originally buy and sell in the temple courts, then at some point the temple leadership must have granted permission for them to do it, right? So if you wanted to, for example, buy and sell something in the city, you don't just start to do it. There are certain permits required. Depending on what you're buying and selling, there are certain licenses you need to have. It is not likely that if there was a time when buying and selling did not happen in the temple courts, it's not likely that suddenly somebody just showed up and started selling. Instead, it would need to have been approved by the temple leadership. And so if this is what happened, then we need to ask, what is it that would have motivated the temple leadership to grant vendors permission to buy and sell in the temple courts? If this was not something people normally did, how does a vendor approach temple leadership and convince them that, hey, would you let us buy and sell in the temple courts during Passover? Well, there needs to be an incentive. There needs to be an incentive. So they would likely have said, okay, if we allow you into the temple courts to buy and sell, there's going to be a cost. Any vendor who wants to sell in the temple courts during Passover will need to pay for that access. And so in this way, the robbery could be in the fact that the vendors were being charged an exorbitant price by the temple leadership. And as a result, the people buying and selling had to uh, charge an exorbitant price for the sheep and cattle. And so in this way, they were robbing people, taking advantage of the system, taking advantage of the, uh, of the, of the feast. Um, and so, you know, in New Jersey, when uh, we were there for 10 years, uh, I heard of, a ch <laughs> heard of a church in town that had an ATM machine in the lobby. And I thought to myself, really? I had never been to this church, but really? And so, you know, ask ourselves, why, <laughs> why would church leadership allow an ATM machine to be placed in their lobby? Was it to enhance the worship experience? No. <laughs> in this, the only reason to, to put an ATM machine in the lobby is to make it easier for people to give money, Right? In the same way, it's not likely that temple leadership allowed buying and selling in the temple because they thought it would improve the temple worship experience. No, they did it for the economic benefit thereof, and Jesus knew it. Now, the second possibility, that's the first possibility about why this, this robbery thing. The second possibility is that buying and selling had been allowed for quite some time, but the result was that it was robbing God of people's adoration. So it could be that all of this marketplace activity in the temple courts distracted the people from one th from the one thing they were they were in the temple to do, and that is worship God by offering their sacrifices. So it would have been similar, I think, to uh, to what's happened to the commercialization of Christmas 
in the world today, right? So because we have allowed the holy day of Christmas to, to exist side by side with the activity of buying and selling what has happened, well, Christmas has lost its meaning in the hearts of many people. Christmas has become about buying and selling and not about the incarnation of Jesus anymore. And so in the same way, this buying and selling in conjunction with temple worship could have robbed God of the people's hearts. They were in the temple courts worshiping, but they were not worshiping while there. They were distracting. And so in that way, they were robbing God. You're taking my people's hearts out of here. When this is the place where they're supposed to realign them here. And so in either of those scenarios, whether Jesus is angry at the extortion that's happening because of the money, or whether Jesus is just angry at the fact that they're taking the attention away from the actual worship, in either case, Jesus has a right to be angry. Jesus could see through the movement of worship to what was actually happening. Jesus was perfect, and he had perfect wisdom. He could see through any scheme to the truth, and he could see through any activity to the real activity. And so what this tells us, what this tells us is that Jesus is not fooled by us either, is he? <laughs> he can see to our heart's core, and there will never be enough incense in all the world to blind God to what's really going on inside of us. God always sees the total picture, and therefore when he acts, he always does the right thing. So we see, first of all, the wisdom of the holiness of God, that nothing is hidden from God's sight. And then secondly, we see the demands of the holiness of God. Notice what Jesus said in verses 15 and 16. He said, it says, uh, so he, he made a whip of cords, Drove them all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. So there's, you know, all of a sudden there's this huge commotion in the temple. Things are flying, cattle are running, cows are mooing, whatever's there. There's a lot of movement. And to those who sold doves, Jesus said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? So Je Jesus came into the temple courts and cleaned house. Right? Now, again, for us Westerners, we don't, we don't like the Jesus like this. Right? We, we want him, yeah, you know, we want, we want him to come into our lives. But when he enters our rooms, we want him to kind of casually look at our mess and say, You know, you know Sean, you might want to clean some of this up and, you know, it, it would really benefit you. And I, and I respond by saying, yes, yes, I know, someday I will. But that's not the God we get in this scene. According to this scene, Jesus enters our rooms and starts throwing things out the window. He tips the bed up with me on it, and, we're, and I'm, I'm heading out the second story window. Um, he, he made a whip of cords, and it, it didn't say, any, he may have hit somebody with it. We don't know. This is not the nice Jesus. Consider this as we try to understand why he's doing this. If a perfect stranger walked into your house okay, and uh, started rummaging through each room saying, yeah, this needs to go, that needs to go, throw that out, take that off the wall, what would you do? <laughs> Kick him out. It ain't your house. Don't tell me what to do in my house, right? Notice what the Jews said to Jesus in verse 18. What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? They asked who gave you the authority to tell us what to do in our house? And by doing this, Jesus was saying, this is my house. I can do what I want in it. Okay. Jesus was giving claim to his authority to decide what happens in the temple. The temple was built for him. Okay. Uh, it was his. And Jesus had every right to reorganize it as he wanted to. Now, we Americans like to say, you know, this is my life, and you know, nobody has any right to tell me how to live in it, or this is my body, and I can do what I want with it. But if Jesus is who he says he is, if Jesus is your creator and mine, then he has every right, doesn't he, to tell us what to do with our lives. It's, it's, it's meant to be his house. It's meant to be his life. And so 
uh, Jesus is, is, is really making a statement of his authority. This is my house. I decide what goes on in it, and this ain't going to happen here. Okay. So, the demands of God's holiness are stricter and more severe than any of us can stand up under. We may think we have a fairly well-ordered life, but the perfect holiness of Jesus would see right through it to our core. Um, Again, we we want God to be warm and fuzzy and gentle, and he is, but he's also holy. Okay, This Jesus kicks us out and tells us that we're not welcome. So what do we make of this? Well, here's what we make of it. We must understand, first of all, that our assessment of things is many times far different than God's assessment of things. Many of the things we justify, Jesus would claim as intolerable. And so think about it. The people in this scene had likely been buying and selling in the temple courts for years and years and years. Every Jewish person that day probably saw nothing wrong with the practice and probably never even considered that it might offend God. And yet Jesus was fuming at it. We must uh, understand that that God's holiness is so much different. He he, he is so much greater. And uh, we cannot automatically assume that our assessment of things would be God's assessment of things. The demands of God's holiness are very, very high. So we see the wisdom of the holiness of God. Jesus can see right through to the intentions of their heart. Number two, we see the demands of God's holiness. Okay? None of us measure up, uh, and that's that's a little bit terrifying, I think. Thirdly, we see the unholiness of mankind. And we're going to jump down to verses 24 and 25 to see this. So look at verses 24 and 25. It says, Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. All right, so modern uh, modern psychology will tell us that it is damaging to talk about people this way. They will say, you know, people do not need to be told they are bad. This gives them an inferiority complex. But listen, we can't help but call each other bad. I mean, seriously. Those who say we should not call people bad would also say that those who call people bad are bad. <laughs> like, we can't help it. What we need, though, what we need is not to bash people over the head with a hammer and tell them how bad they are. We do need truth, though. And the Bible makes clear two essential truths of every human being who has ever lived. And I think thinking through this helps us make sense of why Jesus did not entrust himself to people. So two truths... That are, that are foundational to, uh, to our humanity, that the Bible says. Number one, it says that every human being is made in the image of God and therefore has infinite worth. And by infinite, I mean infinite. Okay. Whenever you interact with anyone anywhere in the world, whether you're at Vista or you're in Peru, you are interacting with people who bear God's image. The very first thing we need to understand, that the very, very first thing we read about mankind in the Bible is not that we are sinners. The very first thing we read is that we are made in God's image. Every human being who has ever lived has incredible, uh, was incredibly special because they were incredibly made. Now, you may not like them. They may have some pretty strange character defects. They may be dishonest and untrustworthy, but that does not change the fact that that they are made in God's image and therefore have incredible value. No other religion or worldview has a higher view of humanity than does Christianity. No other religion gives us more reason to fight for every individual human life than does the Bible. No other religion puts mankind higher than the Bible does. In fact, every other worldview tells us mankind is less special, not more. And so if if it's true, for example, that 
that we are all, that all we are is matter evolved over billions of years, then mankind is no more valuable than the ground we walk on. And if I spit on the ground I walk on, why can't I spit on mankind? We may still, we may believe that, we may have that as our worldview and still believe we should fight for human rights, but the reality is we have no grounds to fight for human rights. Because at our core, we are no different than matter. But what the Bible says is no. God created the world, and then he created something special <laughs> called mankind. And he placed in us, and only in us, his image. And for that reason, every human being has infinite worth and value. I have no right ever to put down or look down on anyone because regardless of what they've done, regardless of uh, uh, you know what their family has done, regardless, they are made in God's image and are worthy of respect. And so um, the first essential truth about humanity is that every one of them, every one of us, who has ever lived, who lives now, who has ever, li ever lived before, uh, is infinitely special because we are made in God's image. We cannot, uh, uh, we cannot get to our sinfulness before we realize that that person is made in the image of God. That's the first reality. Now, the second reality, the second truth is that every human being has tarnished their image of God with what the Bible calls sin. Right? It's kind of like saying. Every car was given a state-of-the-art paint job out of the factory, but every car eventually rusts. There has never been a piece of metal that did not rust, and there has never been a human being who did not sin, except Jesus, of course. Okay? Sin is an inescapable reality of every human being. The reason so many bad things happen in the world is because every person in every city of the world is a sinner. You and I have both contributed to the darkness of our city, whether we like it or not. Okay. Reinhold Niebuhr once said in his book, The Nature and Destiny of Man, he said, There is as much sinfulness in our greatest accomplishments as in our worst failures. The sin of pride pervades all we do. Okay. So let me give you an example. This past week, uh, the kids and I went to Lowe's to get some supplies to build onto our shed, which we are building a new sh sheep or, or goat pen. And um, so uh, we got, got the supplies, and I, and I got home. And later that night, I looked at the receipt, and I realized, I noticed that the cashier only charged me for six of the 23 two-by-fours that I bought. Six. There was like a difference of like $65, $70. And so I eventually went back to Lowe's after I wrestled with the devil about my need to go back to Lowe's. <laughs> I eventually went back to Lowe's, and I told them what happened, and they charged me for the other 17 boards, as they should have. So let me, what was going through my head as I left the store that night? Let me tell you what's going through my head. I was secretly imagining the praise they, would probably give, they were probably giving me back in the store for being such a noble lad. I even thought to myself, you know, I wonder if there's any identification on the receipt where that, whereby they could reward me for my good deed. You know, like mail me a gift card in the mail or something. <laughs> do you see the problem? Like, I can't even do the right thing without simultaneously doing the wrong thing. Okay? <laughs> and this is, this is humanity, okay? The Bible says our hearts are so bent on selfishness that our every act of holiness is tainted with sin. I either contribute to the darkness of my city by the bad things I do, or I contribute to the darkness of my city by the good things I do for all the wrong reasons. Either way, I'm guilty. Now, as Christians, though, the Bible says the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and is transforming our tainted image, but nevertheless, we still do not do everything we ought to do. Would you agree? And so as a result, this, this, is, this is a hard reality here. As a result, none of us can, can be completely trusted. That's kind of depressing. Okay? You can't fully trust your best friend. You know why? Because even though they have not hurt you yet, because they are a sinner, they will eventually hurt you. They may not intentionally hurt you, but inevitably they will. And therefore, and the same is true of you. 
And so when Jesus says in verse 25, Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Jesus was referring to the sinful inevitability of mankind. Jesus knew that today they believe in me, tomorrow they would disown me, and he was absolutely right. His most committed disciple, Peter, <laughs> on the night he was betrayed, said, I'm devoted. And on the night he was betrayed, betrayed him. Jesus knew that even the most committed of his disciples would at times turn their back on him. And so we see the wisdom of the holiness of God. He, it is nothing hidden from God's sight. Secondly, we see the demands of the holiness of God. None of us measure up. Thirdly, we see the unholiness of man. None of us can be trusted. I don't even trust myself. I've made so many bad decisions, I ask somebody else to make them for me most of the time. Okay? And then, <laughs> and my wife gets mad at me. So I have to make, anyways, moving on. Lastly, we see <clears throat> the solution to the holiness of God. And we're going to close with this. Right? Look at verses 18 through 22. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. And they replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. In these verses, Jesus equated himself with the temple. Destroy this temple. I am this temple. Okay. So what does a temple do? Well, a temple is where you go to get close to God, right? A temple is where you offer sacrifices to appease God. A temple is a place you go to to discover who you are and what your life is to be about. And Jesus says, I am the temple. And so what does that mean? That means that Jesus is who you go to to get close to God. He is the one you go to to discover who you are and what your life needs to be about. But unlike a temple, Jesus is not the one we make sacrifices to in order to, to appease God. Instead, Jesus says he is the sacrifice made for us in order to make us appeasing to God. Does that make sense? Okay. When Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it again, he was referring to the fact that he would become our sacrifice on the cross. When Jesus was led to the cross, the people were destroying the temple. They would kill Jesus. And just as they had entered the temple every Passover to offer sacrifices to God, so on the cross, the people would offer Jesus as their sacrifice to God without knowing it. And here's what that means. This means that when we enter Jesus as our temple, he restores the holiness of God to us. When we come to him as our temple, as our perfect sacrifice in the temple, he brings us into the Holy of Holies by his blood, and our tarnished sinful nature is washed away, making us acceptable to God again, making us that clean and perfect and shiny nail that we once were. Jesus is the temple. Jesus is the one we go to to get right with God. Jesus is the temple and the sacrifice. On the cross, Jesus cleaned house in the temple. By his sacrifice, Jesus flipped over the tables of sin that we had worked so long at. On the cross, God got angry. But not at us. At Jesus. Because on the cross, Jesus became sin for us. Jesus entered Jerusalem in John 2 to get rid of the sin in the temple. But on the cross, Jesus entered the Jerusalem to become sin for us in the temple. Okay. Therefore, 
When we believe in Jesus and surrender to him, God is no longer angry at us. God no longer holds our sin against us. When we allow Jesus to be our sacrifice, he meets God's demand for holiness for us. When we come to Jesus, God holds our sin against Jesus and places Jesus' holiness on us. And when this happens, the image of God in us is restored in God's eyes, and the Bible says that we now have fellowship with God once again. We are God's friend again, because Jesus has met the holiness of God in us. Jesus becomes our friend and no longer our unappeasable enemy. So as we prepare now to uh, take communion together, let me ask you, where are you at with Jesus this morning? Have you made him your temple? Has your fellowship with God been restored, not because you've been better than you were, but because Jesus was perfect for you? Is he your temple? Is he your sacrifice? Is he the one that takes away God's anger from you and gives you the grace that we so need?